Okay, everyone, thanks for joining. So in today's session, we're going to talk about stressful life events and how that affects the brain and how we think. So this is supposed to be an interactive session. So I set up a Mentimeter for various questions that I'm going to have on the slides. So you can either go on menti.com and type in the code that's at the top of the slide and you'll be able to see the slide on your phone as well as the question. Or if you prefer to just watch from here, you can just reply to the questions in the chat next door. So it's just whether you'd rather have it in the chat or if you'd rather have an anonymous reply that will play on the screen through the Mentimeter. So I think I've given it a few minutes now, so I'm going to just start the presentation. So I'm just gonna give a bit of an outline into what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna talk about a bit of an introduction on trauma, PTSD, and how this may be related to COVID, and also how we biologically respond to stress and also how we process stressful life events. I'm also gonna discuss cognitive appraisal, which is the way that we interpret events and how that affects our emotional response. Lastly, I'm going to talk about how this all has to do with our coping strategies and how that might relate to whether we carry on having these different thought processes. Lastly, I'm going to talk about protective factors that might reduce the chances of us being traumatized by a specific event, as well as post-traumatic growth. So firstly, I'd just like you to go on Menti or tap into the chat and say, what kind of things would you consider to be a stressful life event? So I'll just give you a few minutes to um, either write in the chat or put it in the Menti. Also, feel free to put as many answers as you want. There isn't a limit for any person. Right, so it looks like there's quite a variety of different stressful life events that people can experience. Um, that seems to be from childhood, could be things like bullying and exams into adulthood. Um, such as loss of family or illness and all of these things can kind of happen at various points of our life and people may experience them as more stressful than others and that depends on our individual differences and how we process that. Some of these seem to be more related to COVID specifically as well so job hunting especially um, there's a lot of financial difficulties during this time and um, that can explain those kind of things as well as things to do with relationships such as breakups and divorce. So I'm just going to talk about what a stressful life event is and how this relates to the trauma definition according to clinical DSM criteria. So a stressful life event is something that is overwhelming and is something out of your control. Um, the DSM criteria for trauma specifically requires actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence. So this shows that not all stressful life events are diagnostically described as traumatic. And this could be things such as psychosocial stresses, such as some of the things that have been brought up like divorce or job loss. Although not all of these things could be described as traumatic according to clinical guidelines, it has been seen that individuals with stressful life events in general can also demonstrate symptoms equivalent to PTSD. And it's very important to consider the individual's view of trauma. Research has shown that some individuals who reported death of a loved one, which is seen as criterion A trauma, did not actually report this as a traumatic event. However, other studies have shown that those who rate themselves as having a criterion A trauma have higher PTSD scores than those who do not think they do. So that just shows how our view of what we consider traumatic actually impacts the kind of PTSD scores that can be experienced. Criterion A trauma used to be split into A1, which would refer to the type of event, and A2, which referred to the experience of the event as fear, horror, or helplessness provoking. And research has found that the idea of it actually provoking horror or helplessness actually predicted criterion A PTSD symptoms compared to what the actual event was itself. So during this talk, I'm going to talk about stressful life events and trauma and kind of interchange between those two definitions, because some people may consider some things traumatic and others would not. <laughs> 
Also, it's important to know that only 10% of individuals who experience trauma will develop PTSD. However, the one month after experiencing a stressful life event, you may experience PTSD-like symptoms that usually after memory processing will reduce over time. And these kind of symptoms are quite normal. So I'm going to be speaking about PTSD quite a lot. And the reason for this is because we may experience some of those symptoms after a stressful life event, even if we are not ending up going to be diagnosed with a PTSD disorder. So as I've discussed, criterion A, according to the DSM, relates to death, actual threat and injury and violation. However, it's also important to think that you do not, not, you do not have to have direct exposure to the event to, for it to be considered traumatic. So that means that we could have witnessed the event happening to someone else. You could have learned about the event that happened to a close friend or relative. Or you could have repeated exposure to distressing details, such as a police officer or therapist who will hear traumatic details from their clients or other individuals, and they can actually experience PTSD-like symptoms from hearing that happening to someone else. So now I just want you to think to yourself and also possibly reply to the Mentimeter what you think post-traumatic stress disorder means, or complex PTSD, if you've also heard of that term. So you can either type it into the chat into what you think it may mean, or you can write it on the Mentimeter. So I'll just give you a few minutes to think about what you think that means. So it seems from some of the things that we're seeing that people have thought it's relating to anxiety and flashback seems to be something that comes up a lot. And I do think that that's one of the symptoms that people think of as most common in PTSD. Also, some reference to it happening after a specific event, which makes sense since that's one of the criteria. OK. So PTSD requires you to have symptoms in various different criteria. So firstly, it's important that you have a criterion A traumatic exposure to something. So the type of event matters in terms of whether you'd meet criteria for this. Also having intrusive symptoms. So that would be the flashbacks, nightmares or intrusive memories, as well as intrusive thoughts that came from those specific events. Also, you have to have at least one type of avoidance behavior. So this may be avoidance of memories, thoughts or feelings or avoidance of people, places and activities that you associate with the event. Also, negative cognition and mood. So you should have some form of negative cognition about yourself, such as low self-esteem, uh, persistent loss of positive emotions, feeling detached from others, amnesia for certain aspects of the event. Also, you need to have at least two types of hyper arousal behavior. So that would be like hypervigilance, where you're constantly looking around you to see if there's a threat or making sure that you feel safe or having an exaggerated startle response where even the smallest kind of noise would startle you because you feel so on edge. This also refers to sleep disturbances as well as maybe irritability and anger outbursts. So you need to have experienced these kind of symptoms for at least one month. And the reason for this is because a lot of these symptoms are quite normal to have after going through a stressful life event. And therefore, it would only be characterized as PTSD after one month. Also, these types of symptoms must significantly impair your functioning and day to day life. So the difference between post-traumatic stress disorder and complex post-traumatic stress disorder is that those with CPTSD have the usual PTSD symptoms as well as additional symptoms that impact their life. So examples of this would be interpersonal disturbance, which means difficulties in their relationships. They may feel like it's harder to trust other individuals and they may have vulnerable attachment styles. They also have negative self-concept, which means that they have negative views of themselves, possibly due to low self-esteem and doubt. Also, they have reduced effective regulation, and this relates to the way that we regulate our emotions and are able to tolerate the extreme feelings that we may have at a given time. So in terms of the cause of CPTSD in specifically, 
This is usually caused by trauma that's repeated over a significant amount of time, such as abuse from a parent or uh, another person from an interpersonal relationship. In childhood, especially, individuals were more likely to have P CPTSD because during childhood, you have a it has a bigger impact on yourself due to your brain still developing and forming new connections. There is a difference as well in terms of recovery from PTSD or complex PTSD. With PTSD, you know what normal is, as you know the kind of normal behavior that you had before an event. However, those with CPTSD usually have repeated trauma and that repeated trauma becomes their norm. And therefore they go through significant personality changes to help coping with this inability to integrate what is happening. And therefore their recovery relies on developing a new sense of normal and a new sense of self rather than going back to how they used to feel. So just another question, and I'm going to show you how this may be related to COVID specifically. So whether this is you, yourself, or someone you know, or if you don't feel like you've experienced any kind of stress due to COVID, then maybe just think of some hypotheticals. But what kind of stressful experiences have you had during COVID? So you can either interact through the chat or put it through the Mentimeter, which the code is on the top. So I'll just wait a few minutes to see if anyone else has some ideas on what kind of stressful experiences that there may be during COVID time. So it seems that some of them are relating to family specifically, which is especially important when we're isolated and we are kind of dealing with new environments that we're not used to dealing with, seeing people more regularly than we would expect. And maybe there can be difficulties with personal space and issues with that. Financial difficulties is also another one that seems to be highlighted. Job hunting, especially considering the uncertainty and the amount of jobs that are lost during this time. So that makes sense. Domestic violence, especially a very toxic environment that you're isolated in. And a lot of individuals might feel like they can't escape that due to the uh, lockdown measures that are being put in place. Air travel as well, feeling like you cannot travel to either see family members or cutting down plans that you felt you had to reassure yourself in terms of um, relaxation. So maybe holidays that we feel we had to cancel or specifically uh, being able to travel and meet families that we usually cannot see. Zoom fatigue, definitely one that I've also experienced. I think the the insistent need to try and connect with people, whether that's through work or recreation, and sometimes the fatigue that can come with that can be quite stressful as well. And we are more likely to feel stress if we are more fatigued. So very good and variety of answers there. So in terms of um, what's been said about COVID and PTSD at the moment. So um, specifically for individuals who are frontline workers and those who've been in hospital with COVID, 20% of those in critical care from COVID specifically suffer significant PTSD symptoms during the first 12 months after discharge. So in one year, 50 to 60,000 cases alone. So this just shows the importance of having trauma-informed care during this time. Um, just as PTSD has increased in armed forces, uh, returning from war, we expect PTSD to be to be more common post COVID as people come to terms with their life changing experiences. So that could be those who've experienced um, COVID itself, going through critical care or family loss from that, as well as the frontline workers, which relates to exposure to traumatic events, as I described in the criterion A trauma. Also, as people mentioned, um, the necessary precautions meant that they were unintentionally creating. Uh, heavy emotional and financial problems for some of individuals they may feel that they've been living in a toxic environment so I think as well as the toxic environment the financial and emotional and psychological issues that come with COVID itself can produce those kinds of symptoms that you may see in PTSD but also stress in general. So now I'm going to talk about how we biologically respond to stress as well as the way that we process stressful memories and then you'll be able to see how this relates to the way that we think relating to that event.
So I'm going to talk about the stress hormone cortisol. So the normal reaction to stress, we have increased levels of cortisol. So I'm going to just mention the abbreviated hormones rather than the full um, the full name, just to make it a bit easier for everyone to understand. So CRH, which is uh, produced by the hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain, it stimulates the release of ACTH from the pituitary gland, which then stimulates the production of cortisol. And cortisol provides negative feedback, which enhances the further release of CRH and ACTH. So this leads to the containment of the stress response. So therefore, when we feel we have high levels of cortisol, we are then able to reduce the chances of CRH and ACTH being stimulated. And therefore, we then can go back to a normal state of non-stress. If the stress response is chronically engaged, the resulting overload may lead to negative mental health outcomes. It's been said in research that in those with PTSD, cortisol levels at baseline may be lower and therefore you have an enhanced responsiveness to stress. So a person may be hyper responsive to different triggers associated with the event that they've experienced. So reduced cortisol in the face of trauma may reflect an adaptation to a hostile environment where continued threat is anticipated. So in this circumstance, low cortisol may facilitate an enhanced and prolonged threat response that doesn't reduce. So it's more the chronicity rather than the severity of violence and any kind of stress that's associated with this low cortisol response. So having low cortisol basically means creating the CIH and ACTH. In terms of how we behave and how that's related to cortisol, arousal is the first step in activating what's called the defense cascade model. So at the onset of threat, mammals will first try to reason their way out of a social situation. And this is called the fawn response, also known as social engagement. So if this is not effective, we'll go into this fight or flight response to escape or confront the situation. So this is seen as an active defense response for dealing with threat. If this is hopeless and therefore overwhelming, this is when the freeze response is activated and the more evolved parts of our brain shut off, such as pain receptors and memory. It's a fight or flight response put on hold, which is seen when we think that a threat is inescapable and when an active defense response has failed. Unlike animals, which generally are able to restore their standard mode of functioning over the danger, humans often are not, and they may find themselves locked into the same recurring pattern of response tied in with the original danger of the trauma and therefore continually produce this behavior. So now I'm briefly going to talk about memory so that you understand which parts of memory are relevant to how we experience stressful life events. So firstly, we have the working memory, and this is a short term memory that has a limited amount of storage of events. We then have the long term memory, which is split into implicit and explicit memories. So implicit memories relates to procedural memory, so doing things without consciously having to recall it. So this could be playing the piano or riding a bike, things we don't consciously have to think about, but are more automatic. Then we have explicit memory. So this relates to episodic memory where events can be reported from a person's life. So records of unique events which occur at particular times. So this is more factual memory, such as what time did I wake up in the morning or what did I eat for breakfast? Well, then there is semantic memory, and this relates more to the meaning behind memories. So it's generic knowledge about everyday happenings, such as what the color of a banana is or the meaning you put towards a memory. And these meanings are generated from your own personal experiences. So in relation to trauma specifically, I'm going to talk about two areas, the hippocampus and the amygdala. So information regarding an event is not completely stored straight away in a long-term memory. Instead, some of the sensory details from this event are slowly processed into long-term storage over time. And this is called consolidation. So the hippocampus is basically very important in combining all of the different sensory details from an event, packaging it together to be then stored in a long-term memory. So it helps the formation of new memories about experience events, helping you also to aid in accessing these. In relation to the amygdala, this is involved in the strength to which memories are processed in long-term storage. So this means that emotional arousal following an event influences the strength of the subsequent memory. It's involved in mediating the effects of emotional arousal on the strength of the memory of an event. So it's most helpful in enhancing the memory of emotionally charged events. So recalling all the details on a day when you experience a traumatic accident. 
So this means that if you feel like you had a neutral event, you're less likely to remember the details of that memory in your long-term memory. However, if you experience an emotionally charged event where you experience intense guilt or fear, then you're more likely to remember more details of that in your long-term memory. So I'm just gonna give a few examples of this so you can see how it works in action. So let's say we have a neutral event where you went to a barbecue. So the hippocampus activity would be increased. It would combine all of the details of the event. So what you were feeling, seeing, what time it was, when it happened, and package it all together for your long-term memory. The amygdala activity would be decreased because you didn't experience fear or an emotionally charged reaction. So therefore, in your long-term memory, you might not remember that much detail. You may just think, I went to a barbecue once. If the event was slightly stressful, the hippocampus would work as usual, computing all of these details together, but the amygdala would also increase the activity and the amount of the detail that is stored in your long-term memory because you felt scared. So you may think, I was walking down the road at 10.30, I could smell burning, and for a minute I felt scared, but then I realized it was a barbecue, so I carried on walking. And I remember this event because I remember feeling scared at the time, so a lot more detail than usual. If you consider the event to be incredibly stressful or traumatic, then the hippocampus activity decreases and is unable to package all of these different sensory details together, and therefore the memory may seem more fragmented. However, the amygdala has increased activity because of these fear responses that you felt. And therefore, in the long-term memory, you may think, I randomly smell burning now, sometimes I feel really scared and I'm not sure why, and I feel like the, ha the event is happening all over again now. So because of this amygdala activation, you're more likely to have this memory triggered involuntarily relating to this st stimuli. And that's because of how much fragmentation has been done and how these details have not been put together through the hippocampus. Also, because there is reduced temporal context, so you don't remember the specific facts on how long it happened and how long ago it happened, you may feel the emotions and the sensations as if they're happening all over again now and you're going through the event now. So now I'm briefly going to talk about how we interpret events and emotional response. So I'm going to be asking a bit more questions for some interaction here too. So firstly, I'm going to talk a bit about the characteristics of the way that we appraise an event. And when I say appraise, I refer to the way that we personally interpret a situation. So there are many factors that affect how we interpret a specific event. So I'm just going to go through a few of them. So firstly, um, characteristic events such as duration and predictability may influence processing. So for example, an accident you can see coming is easier to conceptually process rather than a random traffic accident that happens and you weren't expecting it. Having a sense of mental defeat also may affect processing and this usually occurs during events of a longer duration. Previous trauma and coping styles may also play a role. So, for example, a trauma may reactivate memories of a previous stressful experience that you had that has also not been processed correctly in the amygdala or the hippocampus. Prior beliefs that you also have as an individual may also play a role. So if you believe that no one could ever be harmed and everyone is trustworthy and then you're assaulted, you may find it easier, you may find it harder to understand what was going on and therefore harder to process that memory. There are also state factors such as alcohol consumption, general exertion and degree of fear that may influence the ability to process the situation in an organized way. And of course, these different states will then affect the kind of strategies that we use. So now for another question, I just wanted to think what kind of thoughts um, you individuals come up with when you've had a stressful event. So this could be any kind of event, uh, whether that was you know, waking up too late in the morning for a meeting or whether that's something traumatic you feel has happened to you. Just some of the kind of thoughts that go through your head after you've had an event and it can be relating to any situation. I'll just give a few more minutes in case people have any uh, further responses they want to give. <laughs> 
So some of the thoughts that people have stated is like, was it my fault? So sense of responsibility and guilt um, in terms of just being glad that it didn't happen. Uh, it won't happen again. So thank God it's over. I want to stay away from that. So avoidance behavior as well, which is very common. Is there any meaning that can come from this? So a lot of individuals try to seek meaning and find that way as a way of processing what has occurred. Feeling like there's no way out. So that sense of lack of hope, which is also a common feeling. It's also interesting to know that depression, about 50% of individuals with PTSD also experience comorbid depression due to this hopelessness feeling. So although that's more clinically said, it is quite common to have kind of depressive like symptoms after an event as well, feeling that sense of hopelessness. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the thoughts that we may have of the specific event itself and then go through some examples of things we may think of the consequence of the event and how it may have affected our life. So the fact that it happened in general, some individuals may think that the next disaster is going to happen soon and that nowhere is safe because of what specifically happened. The fact that it happened to you specifically, you may have views of yourself, such as responsibility for what happened, thinking that you're a victim and labeling yourself according to what happened to yourself, or that you attract bad things and that bad things will happen to you. So this could relate to a specific, very traumatic incident, or this could just relate to everyday stresses and therefore thinking that um, you are kind of attracted to these kind of situations and therefore trying to take some responsibility and maybe also see in a way how you could control it not happening again in the future. Taking responsibility for these things does provide us with a sense that we can control the situation next time, even if it's something that just happened by chance or that wasn't in your control. So the emotions of the trauma, you may believe that you can't cope with it because it's such an extreme emotion that you weren't expecting or that you deserved it to happen to yourself. So these are just some examples of things that you may think according to uh, a cognitive model of PTSD. So now I'm going to talk briefly about the kinds of appraisals we might have relating to the consequence of a traumatic event. So this might be the interpretation of how we feel, whether that relates to PTSD symptoms um, or just symptoms in general, the way that we interpret other people's reactions to the event and the way that we are appraise the consequences that the trauma might have on our everyday life in other different domains. So I think it's important to think that once something traumatic has happened or what you would consider a very stressful life event, it is very common to experience things like flashbacks, irritability, mood swings, lack of concentration, numbing and intrusive recollections. And these are normal, normal symptoms that you might have after a traumatic event. And usually these do go away by themselves. And that explains why only 10 percent of individuals develop PTSD, because this, usually your memory is able to process these memories over time. However, if you believe during the time that there's something wrong with you and you have enhanced negative appraisals of these symptoms, it's more likely that these symptoms will persist after one month and therefore you'd more likely have PTSD and develop that kind of disorder. However, if you have these symptoms and you believe that this is a natural response and instead of avoiding them and thinking that there's something wrong with you, you kind of accept these emotions, you're more likely for them to be processed naturally. So in terms of the symptoms, which can be either whether you have PTSD or whether you've just experienced an event and those kind of uh, symptoms you may have in terms of anger, you may think that um, you this affects the relationships that you have with other people. You may think that your whole personality has now changed just because of these short term symptoms you have after an event. You may have emotional numbing and think that you're dead inside or that you can't relate to other people again because other people aren't going through the experience that you are. You may have these flashbacks and nightmares due to the amygdala, not pro enhanced processing of the amygdala and the reduced context that's being given to this event and therefore think that you'll never get over it because there's this uncontrollable aspect. And you may have difficulty concentrating and see how that will influence other, ever, other kinds of parts of your life. In terms of other people's reactions, so if they're positive, you may feel that you're unable to feel close to anyone because they're not feeling the kind of negative feelings that you're going through. Or you may think that they are stronger than you, even though they haven't experienced it themselves and you were the one that went through that emotion and that event. In terms of negative reactions, if you feel that people are dismissive and not listening to you, you may think that you can't rely on other people and therefore feel more isolated. And that sense of isolation is key to these persistent symptoms continuing. <laughs> 
There are, of course, other consequences. So if you have a physical consequence from an event, you may feel that it means you're unable to lead the life that you led beforehand and loss of job or money and the stresses that come with that as well. So now briefly, um, maybe it will be slightly easier than the specific thoughts that you thought after an event. What kind of emotions do you usually experience after any kind of stressful life event? So this could be positive or negative. Obviously, I'm talking about it from more of a negative viewpoint, but there are some instances that I'll discuss later on of the positive things that can come from an event. I'll just give a few more minutes in case other people have some ideas. Okay, so it seems like there's quite a wide range of emotions. So the most common one seems to be relief. I'm seeing that in the chat as well. So maybe relief that it's not going to happen again. And that might be because you feel that... Um, is something your life is something you can control now and that you're not likely to experience that kind of event again or you've put yourself in a situation where it might be less likely to occur strength so there are some positives resilience so that's quite good and i'm going to talk a bit about resilience later on and how that relates to post-traumatic growth which is something which would be considered the opposite of post-traumatic stress disorder anger so that's obviously a common reaction as well i described it in terms of one of the key PTSD symptoms that you would have relating to a high arousal and this threat response. So you're more likely to feel anger, whether that's from the event or just in general. Guilt. So um, that's also in the chat is said earlier on guilt as an aspect of feeling like you were somehow responsible for the event. So quite a few different ranges of emotions that people can feel. So I've just stuck to some of the negative ones just to say, m be more con consistent with what I've been discussing. So in terms of anger, this may be when you feel that like you've been violated in some way, whether that was an assault that occurred or whether that was just from the stressful life event. In other terms, you may feel guilt. So believing that you were responsible for the event, this may be this may be something that you may not actually have been responsible for it, but you just have this inherent need to feel like it did. It was something that you could control in some way. And therefore, if you acted slightly differently, it may not have happened. Fear may have occurred if you felt like nowhere is safe. So you're generalizing the fear that you may have experienced during the event to the rest of your life afterwards. So this may be specific situations or places or just this generalized fear. And that's also related to this way that we're processing fear in the amygdala, that increased activation that doesn't decrease after the event has occurred. Shame is also another response that people may feel. And this may be due to some sort of violation that occurred during the event. And sadness. So sadness could also relate to not just perceived loss, such as a death of an individual, but also a perceived loss of a life that you may feel like you can't have now. So the change and something that you may you feel that you've lost from your life. So most patients or individuals with persistent symptoms, as I've discussed, so avoidance, hypervigilance kind of behaviors, they experience a wide range of negative emotions. So this is partly because different appraisals are activated at different times and with a different degree of conviction. So, for example, the possibility that a loss may occur tends to be associated with anxiety, whereas perceived certainty of a loss is associated with depression. So that just shows that just the conviction of a thought can produce very different kinds of feelings and emotions. So I'm briefly just going to talk about how memory relates to appraisal. So when individuals recall a kind of stressful life event or traumatic event, their recall is biased by their appraisal. So they selectively retrieve information that's consistent with the way that they are thinking. So, for example, if someone had a trauma of a car accident and then thought that nobody cared about her, 
She may recall only the unfriendly responses of nurses in the hospital, but would not recall that, that several people had tried to help her after the accident and the supportive family that she has. So therefore, selectively retrieving some parts of your memory that, that do not contradict your appraisal means that your view will never change. So you're constantly just picking the bits of the memory that support your argument, even if it means that you continuously have these negative thoughts. Also, you could have negative appraisals about the memory gaps that you have. So due to this fragmentation in your memory, you may not remember every aspect in detail or in chronological order. And therefore, this could produce different kinds of appraisals, such as thinking that there's something wrong with you because your memory is not working right, or that something worse may have happened that you don't remember and the fear of that, or in some way feeling that you're responsible. So I think it's important to think in terms of emotions that those who experience stressful life events that they would consider traumatic show difficulties identifying and labeling own emotional state. And part of this may be due to this involuntary re-experiencing, which means that you experience the emotions from the event as if they are happening in the here and now and therefore may experience it exactly the same. And in these situations, it's important to think about what specific triggers then create this emotional response. So any kind of stimuli that have been presented before or after an event can then make you predict severe danger. So one example would be a man who's kidnapped, for example. So now after he's been rescued, he's still having flashbacks of the event and he feels this emotional fear a lot of the time, especially when he hears a knocking on the door. He may therefore, every time he hears that knocking, feel this emotional fear and not be sure as to why exactly that's happening. And then thinking more into the actual memory, he may realize that it wasn't actually the knocking on the door that promoted this fear response, but more the footsteps of the individual who was kidnapping him outside of the door. And the hearing of the footsteps of him coming up to the door was actually where he started to fear, feel this fear response and feel very scared and not so much the knocking. So then identifying that trigger means that in everyday life now, he can understand that it's more the footsteps that he hears in general life, more so than the knocking. And therefore, understanding this trigger could then help use different kinds of strategies to reduce this emotional response. So understanding the specific association between the trigger or stimuli and the emotion can therefore be the first step onto reducing these kind of emotional responses. <coughs> So as I said, um, there is some research that shows that individuals who've experienced very stressful life events show difficulty identifying and labeling their own emotional state. And research has shown that traumatized individuals compared to non-traumatized individuals found to reported more difficulties tolerating and regulating their negative emotions. So they had a higher level of fear of emotions and higher amounts of avoiding these negative feelings and unwillingness to experience these negative thoughts and feelings with a high effort to escape them. They've also shown that the majority of survivors of interpersonal trauma, so maybe assault or some sort of violence from people that you may know, like family members or um, people you're in a relationship with, they reported difficulties appropriately regulating their emotions. So through that avoidance behavior or kind of suppressing those feelings of fear and anger and were more impulsive, so more self-destructive behavior. So now I'm going to talk about different coping strategies that you may use when you feel these kind of negative thoughts. And there will obviously be another interactive aspect of this, asking you what kind of coping strategies you may put in different kinds of situations. So firstly, thinking about um, when you're thinking about a stressful life event in general. So thinking, oh, if I think about this, I might lose control, I might go mad, or any kind of negative appraisal that you may have. So if you had negative feelings from an event, what would you do in general? What would be your first kind of response if you were thinking about something and then thought, oh, oh no, wait, that's going to make me think, that's going to make me feel horrible in some way. What would be your first response? So I'm just looking at some of the answers now. So we have try not to think about it. So like distraction techniques, 
breathe deeply that's quite good so that's kind of grounding yourself and allowing yourself to feel those kind of emotions cycling so that's quite a healthy way of dealing with that strategy kind of putting all that energy that you may feel either from fear or negative reaction into a healthy output avoiding it when possible so a kind of avoidance behavior let me look there's a bit more writing so that's another way of expressing those kind of emotions and then in the chat as well so feeling of frustration so not being able to kind of figure out ways to reduce these feelings because they can be quite overwhelming and sometimes it's very difficult to figure out ways to reduce that listening to music that's quite a good one as well spending time with friends so that seems to be one that's come up a few times as well so for example some individuals may find it hard not to think about it and might try and keep your mind occupied in any way that isn't seen as like a healthy method so for example alcohol use or drug use or any kind of avoidance behavior where you're not acknowledging the emotions that you're feeling more healthy strategies could be to talk to friends and family or to kind of release that energy in a healthier way such as writing listening to music um, exercise especially because of the endorphins that are released also, it's important to try and avoid unhealthy distraction mechanisms and realize that these emotions are short term and they will pass and not overthinking the actual emotions that you're experiencing. Also, another one that could be considered is the idea of not being able to control your emotions and the strategies that come with that. So feeling like you have to numb your emotions, avoid anything that could cause positive or negative feelings because of that feeling like you don't want to be over exaggerated with your emotions and a healthier kind of strategy for that maybe to challenge situations where fear are done at a tolerable level so for example if you feel stressful in a specific situation such as at a bus stop because of a stressful event that occurred at that bus stop you may try and avoid any scenarios where you're by a bus stop so instead of avoiding all of these situations and therefore not testing out that it might not actually cause you to be unsafe as it has done in the past it might be better to kind of walk a few steps every day closer to the area where you have the most fear, but obviously in a testable and bearable amount. So not overwhelming yourself and exposing yourself to a lot of fear at once. It's also important to consider taking time off and not overwhelming yourself with doing too much and just experiencing those emotions. You're more likely to be able to process those memories correctly if you do that rather than avoiding them altogether. So another situation which relates more to the event that I just spoke about, so kind of doing anything similar to what you did during the event when it occurred or seeing friends in general and them asking you about how you feel in rela relation to the specific event or feeling stressed. So if you had reminders of an event specifically or maybe just not event, but just stress in general or friends who asked about it, what would you do in that situation? So it seems like some people are saying avoid it. So that can, seems to be quite a common reaction is kind of avoiding that situation, whether that's with the friends or reminders. And then other people are saying talk about it and express that. And those are two quite normal reactions to have and roll with the punches. So that's just kind of um, going with the flow of things and not maybe stressing too much about how people are reacting to what I've experienced or the kind of reminders that I'm getting. So in some situations, it's very natural to avoid and not all situations should you completely expose yourself to a stress because it can be very overwhelming. But of course, you don't want to have so much avoidance behavior that it impacts your life completely. So it makes sense to want to maybe deflect a question that someone asks rather than completely avoid seeing that person in general out of fear that they may ask you about it. Same thing with avoiding the site of the event or avoiding anything that reminds you of it. <clears throat> 
And then it goes with the um, kind of reaction that we stated, rolling with the punches. So using grounding techniques to remind yourself of the here and now. I think also it's important considering the way that we process stress. It's important to have these techniques where we remember where we are now and remember that we are not, are not in the situation that we have been in the past. So now I know what we've briefly run over time. So I'm just going to quickly talk about post-traumatic growth and protective factors. <coughs> so firstly... What would you use to reduce your stress after an event? So I know we've briefly spoken about coping strategies, but this can be anything a bit more general. So there seems to be quite a lot of physical ways that people use to reduce stress. So um, sports and exercise, music is quite good, reading a book. So kind of uh, stimulating your brain in another way, anything relaxing. So that hot bath or spa, so kind of make you feel like you're not having that sense of threat in your life and that your body can uh, reduce the stress response because you are feeling physically more relaxed, such as the hot water. Talking to friends about it, so expressing those feelings more. Meditation, so kind of the grounding techniques that we mentioned. So in terms of personality traits, so for post-traumatic stress resilience, so post-traumatic resilience, this is a behavior adaptation to stress where you feel like you're able to go back to your optimal level of functioning. So the kind of traits in, from research that are associated with that are high self-esteem, extroversion, so being more extroverted. I think that's more to do with the fact that you're able to express your feelings more with the people around you and therefore process it more. And an internal locus of control. So that means that you're more likely to think that things are in your control and rather less likely to think that there are external forces that are controlling your life. In terms of the resilience, this may be having uh, more of a sense of humor, being more flexible, which means you're more likely to think of uh, different thoughts and challenge your thoughts and think that maybe your viewpoint isn't correct and there may be other ways to interpret things. <coughs> and lastly, in terms of post-traumatic growth. So this is experienced as a positive change that occurs after a stressful event. And this can include increased appreciation for life in general and many smaller aspects of it, along with a changing sense of what's important. So this sense of being lucky is not uncommon and a changed sense of priorities has been said, seen in studies of individuals who've experienced trauma in some way. Also, the experience of an increased sense of compassion, particularly for others who now share the same difficult fate. So if you've gone through a stressful event and then you see someone else is going through the same stress that you've experienced, you're more likely to feel an increased sense of compassion. Also, the idea that strength is correlated with an increased sense of being vulnerable. So a domain experience as a combination of the clear knowledge that bad things can and do happen and a discovery that if you've handled this, then you can handle just about everything. So there is a great engagement with existential questions and an engagement in itself may be experienced as growth. So in each of the aspects that I've stated, the general paradox is that out of loss, there is gain. So, for example, in a situation where people are more limited in the choices they have because of the stress, they're more willing to explore opportunities that they would have never considered before. So there has been research that's shown positive changes from stressful events, and it's not all negative. So just to summarize, I did an introduction talking about trauma, PTSD, and how this may relate to COVID. I've spoken about the cortisol stress hormone and how that relates to the parts of our brain associated with memory processing. I've spoken about the way that we think and how that relates to emotions, as well as the coping strategies that we may use because of this. I've also briefly spoken about the protective factors and post-traumatic growth.